So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Croucher Foundation uh, Study Awards application webinar. I'm Sissy Lowe, Head of Grants from Croucher Foundation and also uh, with me, as you can see from the screen, is Anna Law, uh, Scholarship Officer uh, from Croucher Foundation. Okay. And also you can see we have three scholars uh, uh, and fellows uh, joining us today. We have Richard Tse, uh, who is our um, fellow from uh, Cambridge University, and Daniel Sin uh, from Imperial College, our scholarship re recipient, and also uh, Yilok, uh, our studentship recipient from HKU. They will be introducing themselves later on and help us with some of the uh, Q&A that some of you have sent to us. And also uh, later we can chat uh, amongst the uh, webinar as well. Uh, just some housekeeping rules. Uh, this webinar is about one hour. Um, I will spend some time to walk through the application process uh, with you. Um, and then the rest of the time, uh, we will have a discussion with uh, our scholars uh, answering some of the practical questions that you may have on uh, applying to scholarships and fellowship schemes. Okay. And this session uh, is being recorded, as you can see from the recording button. Uh, we will put up this uh, recording onto our website for uh, uh, public viewing as well. And uh, for participants, um, we are expecting over 100, and some of you are dialing in just now. Uh, please note that you cannot unmute because this is a Zoom uh, webinar setting. Uh, but uh, I'm sure as and when we speak and when we introduce some of the schemes and application details, you may have some follow-up question. You can see the Q&A uh, button um, at the bottom. You can type in questions there. Either uh, we can answer it live or my colleague Anna or the scholars will be typing in the answer depending on time and depending how, how we can uh, answer those questions. And you can also vote on some of the questions that have already appeared. So it will come on top apparently, yeah? So we can uh, know which ones are more popular and we can answer those first, yeah? Uh, what else? Yep, I think that's it. Um, let me just share my screen, if I may. Okay. Okay. So, um, can you all see my screen here? Yeah. Not yet, not yet, sorry. I want to share my desktop. Hope it's loading, okay. Yep. Okay, uh, so you are here for the webinar and we will be introducing you uh, four of our schemes, uh, scholarships for doctoral study, as PhD for overseas studies, fellowships for postdoctoral research, uh, studentship tenable in Hong Kong as PhD in Hong Kong, and science communication studentship. This one, uh, some of you might be interested, but not as many as the other three. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll let our scholars to introduce themselves. We have Richard, Daniel, and Yilok here. And I think uh, Richard and Yilok, uh, you have a PowerPoint to share as well, uh, just a slide introducing uh, yourself. So let's start with Richard. Ah. There we go. Yep. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. So I did my undergraduate in HKU in 2013, which is a decade ago. And I was majoring in chemistry. And after I graduated, I went to Oxford with a Croucher scholarship. And I was doing a DPhil in inorganic chemistry. And my advisor was Professor Paul Beer, who do this host gas chemistry. And I was specializing in this N9 recognition. And after I graduated, I went back to Hong Kong actually to do a postdoc with Dr. Ho Yu Ao Yong and also working on this host gas chemistry thing. 
And I stayed there for one and a half year. And uh, well, in the meantime, I applied for the Crouch Fellowship and I got it. And here I am at the Cambridge University doing um, this material chemistry aspect. So I think my situation is a bit different because I'm not currently on the Crouch Fellowship. I'm on, I'm on something called the Todd Croucher Junior Research Fellowship. So I think it is, um, so it is provided by the Christ College in Cambridge. So it is like an agreement between the Croucher Foundation and also Christ College. And I'm now working with Professor Owen Sherman on these self-healing materials. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you guys. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. So Richard is a multiple award winner. Uh, may I say that? Yeah, awardees. Yeah. Um, not a winner. Yeah. Um, so yeah. culture scholarship, culture fellowship, and taught culture uh GRF. So uh, later on, if we have any questions on applying PhD or even to fellowship, uh, I'll look to you, Richard, uh, for, for your comments and advice. Okay. Okay. Um, then let's have Daniel. Let me give us a, a quick introduction of yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, hey guys, uh, my name is Daniel. Um, so to give a bit of background, uh, I first did my undergrad in the United Kingdom at Durham University. So that's like up north. And I did it from 2018 to 21. And I did it in, I did a bachelor's of biological sciences. And that was when I had started developing an interest in microbiology and in stuff like how bacteria adapt to things. And so after doing my undergrad, I went back to Hong Kong and I joined the Toon Lab over at first at Hong Kong U and then at CUHK, where I looked specifically more into gut microbiota. And then also uh, that was where I developed an interest in bacteriophages, which is this virus that can kill bacteria. But basically I just did uh, a bunch of research there for two years. And that was when I realized I wanted to delve into it more. And so I decided I'll pursue a PhD. And so that's when I reached out to some potential supervisors, as well as applied to the Croucher uh, Doctoral Scholarship. And now I'm here um, at the Panadis Lab at Imperial College London. Um, you can see there's no, no photo of that yet because I've only started a week ago, but um, I'm here to work on um, bacteriophage phage interactions in the context of microbiota. So like bacterial communities. And uh, you can see how like that kind of interest has kind of fostered based off of like what I found interesting in my undergrad and what I thought was also interesting in when I was in Hong Kong for a bit. And yeah, so that's that. Um, my email and my Twitter uh, or X handle is on the top left. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out to me there. Uh, and I'm happy to take, yeah, yeah, happy to take any questions. Look forward to hearing you guys, what you guys have to say. So yeah, thanks. Thank you, Daniel, and thanks again, Richard. Daniel calling in uh, very early, nine in from the UK. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, um, good luck. Um, okay. Um, can you introduce yourself to everyone here? Okay. Yeah, sure. So, oh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So, hello, everyone. My name is Elog. So I don't have a slide, but I can briefly walk you through like my background and stuff. So I actually did my um, undergraduate, which is a Bachelor of Biomedical Sciences in the University of Hong Kong. And during my uni study, I did multiple like summer internships, mainly focusing on HCC, which is the major form of liver cancer, and also playing around with stem cells. Um, in my final year project, um, major objective is trying to characterize like a humanized antibody for HCC therapies. And I found like huge passion in my project and therefore I've decided to continue my PhD study also in the same lab. So currently I am doing my first year PhD study in Professor Stephanie Ma's lab in the uh, in the University of Hong Kong as well with um, culture studentship also focusing on liver cancer and maybe slightly uh, touching on immunology. So nice to meet you all and I'm happy to take any questions. Can I just check if you can all hear me okay, um, Anna? Yes. Really? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, let me just stop the share. I'll connect my earphone again. Sorry about that, everyone.
Hello. Okay, I yeah, hope it better. works. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, hope it works better now. Okay, let's continue. Okay, um, so what you're looking at now uh, should be uh, some slides on uh, the eligibility uh, application process for applying to Croucher Fellowship, Scholarships and Studentships. So just a quick run through uh, on some of the items that uh, you might have put in as uh, uh, some pre-questions, pre-submitted questions for us. Uh, and I will also show you all the uh, questions that you have submitted so we can answer them one by one and discuss in detail. Uh, the first is the Croucher Fellowships for postdoctoral uh, research eligibility uh, is that you should have obtained uh, postdoctoral degrees after uh, 2022 September. Okay, and the duration of the fellowship is up to two years. For scholarships for doctoral studies, PhD for overseas eligibility. But some of you have asked this question about eligibility and it's on our website. Uh, you should have obtained first class honors in your first degree or a higher degree, which can be a master's or MPhil degree uh, by September, 2024. MPhil transfer to postdoctoral will not be considered as equivalent. Okay, please note that. And for students in their final, uh, year of uh, their first degree are welcome to apply, but uh, this will be conditional on you obtaining first class honors uh, by the time you graduate in, say, July 2024. Duration of scholarships will be tenable up to and including the third year uh, of the relevant PhD program. Um, so it's for full, full th uh, three year from the first to third year. So if for some cases, if a candidate uh, in the second bullet point here, um, if you apply from the second year of your PhD study, you will get the two year of support. If you apply in your third year, um, for your third year, then you will just get your third year of uh, uh, funding support from us if you are selected. Very similar eligibility for studentships, uh, PhD in Hong Kong. Uh, also, um, for we will need first class degree or higher degree, a uh, master's degree. Um, students in their final year are welcome to apply. And in terms of the uh, duration, tenure of the award, uh, that's similar um, with the uh, scholarships that I just showed you. Okay, I'll quickly show you where you can find the information because I, I copied the uh, text from our website. So this is the Croucher website, uh, as you can see. Click on funding, study awards, and you will see all these three that I mentioned. Um, you might see different layout in funding and about us because we are updating our design, but the texts are basically the same. You can see the eligibility that I've just mentioned, but in more detail, value of the awards, which is quite comprehensive of the whole package that you receive um, as an awardee. Duration of scholarships, and very important, how to apply. Okay, some of you asked about um, uh, how long your proposal can be and about references. Please um, also look into the notes for applicants. I hope it's big enough. Okay, uh, here I'll be um, having detail, um, the research proposal, how you can prepare the length of the proposal, the format um, about publication. Some of you asked about, um, should you put in publication? And it, as long as it's a part of the six pages, yeah, and we, we will go through that. Um, choices of institutions, about references, and certificates, documents that you will need to submit as well, and also interview. Okay. And some points about whether you can hold concurrence awards or not. Okay. 
So these are important notes for application. So please uh, look into that before you uh, submit the application. Okay. Uh, same for fellowship and studentship. The layout, this is the uh, old layout. We are transitioning our website, uh, but all the points are similar and you can download the notes for um, applications here. Okay, I hope that's useful. Okay, and let's move on to um, the pre-submitted questions. Uh, on some of the technical parts, Anna and myself will, will answer, but I'll look to our, our scholars and fellow to help me with some of the answers on more on the um, application, references, research areas and interviews, okay? Okay, so uh, who is eligible for fellowship? Uh, we looked into the eligibility just now, so hope that's useful. And uh, do I need to submit my PhD thesis before applying to the um, Croucher Fellowship? Um, no, um, you can submit uh, afterwards, but we will need to see the completion of your PhD uh, when we uh, confirm the award with you. Okay, do chip in, uh, Anna, if I missed anything or if you have anything to supplement. Okay. And is it possible for part-time PhD study for clinicians? Uh, no, not for our uh, uh, scholarships and fellowships. Okay. Um, can final year PhD student apply? Can current PhD student apply? I think we covered that in the eligibility. Uh, final year PhD students are welcome to apply. Okay. Uh, would students in their second year have lower chance? Uh, no, depending uh, what that question referred to, that might mean um, you're applying for a two-year support for your scholarship. Uh, for final year PhD, you might be considering a future PhD study, then that's possible too. Uh, can someone apply for a Hong Kong-based scholarship and an overseas one? Uh, I suppose that would mean applying to both our scholarship and studentship. Uh, the answer is no, please choose either one. And um, if I were to pursue P, uh, do you feel at Oxford, do I need to make a separate application? Uh, no, at the application stage, because we will process all applications to, fund, uh, to Culture Foundation in one go. If you are applying to uh, Oxford University and uh, they uh, consider you for the uh, Oxford Croucher uh, Scholarship, then uh, once they have uh, accepted you and agreed, then they might have some forms to fill, but that's not an application. So just apply to uh, the Croucher uh, uh, Scholarship uh, itself and uh, we will take it from there. Will I be eligible? if I did my undergraduate and master's at an overseas institution, uh, where we welcome, we have quite a lot of uh, applicants from overseas institutions, uh, as long as you are Hong Kong permanent residents, okay? Um, can I reapply next year if I am not over this year? Um, yes, you can, uh, but we are unable to provide feedback uh, for unsuccess unsuccessful applications, yeah? And you can indicate if you have applied before. Okay. Anything that um, you would like to supplement, Anna or Scholars? Yep, thank you. Okay, uh, more questions on eligibility. Um, are there any other study awards that support local postdoctoral researchers? Uh, no, not from Croucher uh, Foundation. Uh, does it Available or um, for does it available for an architecture post uh, postgraduate student? And uh, no, we do not uh, uh, provide funding for architectural studies as so, of uh, PG uh, study research. What specific areas are included under the sciences and medicine programs, or for example, uh, global health, uh, epidemiology, behavioral health? Um, these are very broad topic areas, 
but in general, no. Uh, we would look into um, um, the specific research areas. Um, so either you can write to us with your uh, proposed topic and we can check for you, but with um, keywords that general, we may not be able to just answer yes or no. Okay, so it depends on your research proposal and title really. Okay, um, research topics. If I am applying for more than one PhD projects with different topics in the same field, how should I go about writing the research proposal? Will I still, research, uh, will I still re receive funding if I'm selected for a different proposal stated in the proposal? Uh, we highly recommend you to um, choose your research topic when you fill in your application. You can uh, submit two names of uh, institutions, but one um, research title, research area. So by the time you uh, apply to us, we hope you'll be um, more specific because we don't usually allow the change of um, research area or institution after the uh, offer is given to you because uh, the interview is based on the application, what you have indicated in your form university and the research and the discussion in the interview as well is based on that. Yeah. Is it possible to be awarded a fellowship to continue working in the current research group but on a different research topic? Um, we would recommend uh, applicants to uh, consider um, a new topic for their fellowship. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what details, if successfully awarded the student should do we uh, are we required to submit progress reports from time to time? Yes. Uh, that's for studentships, scholarships, and fellowships. For re um, year the renewal, we would need a progress report from the uh, awardee and also the supervisor uh, as well. Yeah. Upon satisfactory uh, um, content uh, of the report, we will renew the uh, scholarships for the next year. Are there any requirements that I need to fulfill after receiving the scholarship? Return to Hong Kong, uh, right report. Uh, um, we, re we get that question quite a lot, return to Hong Kong. Uh, no, that's not a requirement. Um, our scholars uh, can continue uh, work uh, in another country. So it's not a requirement that once they finish their awards with us, they need to return to Hong Kong. Um, okay, requirements for publication. Is it essential to have several publications before applying? Um, if no publication, would it be a disadvantage? Uh, the second question is also similar. How important is publication rate in the, in the application? How many publications uh, uh, students need to have? Uh, is in the uh, Knoxville applicants, it mentioned about publication. You are welcome to uh, list out your publications, first and second author uh, in, in the uh, application form. So it will be good if we can see some of the applications that you may have, okay? Any supplement from our speakers about publications? Um. I was just going to talk, um, if you don't mind me pointing out, um, for the publications bit, I think um, it wouldn't necessarily, uh, like, yeah, sure, like having a publication is great, but it also depends on whether or not the area, the research area of that publication is like relevant to the research area of your um, proposal, right? Because if it's a completely different area or it's a very different project, then it might be indicative of your research abilities, but um, it's not entirely relevant to that research that you're about to, that is relevant to this application. So it's not gonna give you, I would I would assume the advantage isn't like, you know, it's not a make or break is what I'm trying to mm. say, but yeah. So put in publications, if you have uh, about the area that you are going to research more. Okay. Yeah, and also I think for scholarship, I think it doesn't really matter if you have 
not that many publications. We now apply only got one publication as a second or third author. And mm -hmm. I think for fellowship, I think it might be maybe a bit more because you have done your PhD, so you are supposed to um, have done research and you should have like published at least a few papers, I think. So when I did my fellowship application, I have like um, three published one and then four they're either submitted or to be submitted. Mm. Just I should add some point here. Mm. Thank you, Richard, for the reference. Um, okay. As for studentship, Good I would luck. agree with what the previous um, members also mentioned. Um, since for the studentship, we are assumed to do the PhD in later stage. So some of us maybe just finish undergraduate or finish their master's. So it would be great to have um, publication. But in my case, actually, I did not include any any publication in my application, but I'm still able to get their studentship. Yeah. Thank you. Good luck. Okay. Can you see my screen or you can see the um, Zoom cameras as well? No? It's not blocking. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, requirements to return to Hong Kong or benefit Hong Kong through research uh, is quite similar to the previous question about returning to Hong Kong. Does Croucher give priority to research that can benefit Hong Kong? Um, is it a requirement to return to Hong Kong after completing the studies or research? Uh, uh, the answer is no, not really. Uh, the research content itself uh, is more important uh, than whether it benefit a particular region or country. Yeah. Number of applicants, uh, pass rate. Uh, that was asked um, previous years as well in our uh, in our. Um, webinar. So the pass rate is about 20 to 25%. Um, so yeah, it. I'm not going to disclose the number of applications that we have. Yeah. Uh, tax, will the allowance salary be uh, liable to tax in the host country or in Hong Kong? Um, we, uh, Anna and I are not experts in the tax here, but um, it might be applicable depending on the passport you hold, the citizenship you are. Um, so, and also whether, say, in the UK or US, there might be tax liable. But um, for this one, you, uh, we, I may need to look at our scholars to see if they have any comments on that one. I'm sorry we today because of time zone, we couldn't have a US uh, fellow with us, but uh, Richard, Daniel, if you can comment on text in the UK. Yeah, um, so for my case, because it counts as a scholarship, um, I don't need to pay tax while I'm here in the UK. Yeah. Hmm. Richard? And for me, I think if, because I'm not currently on a fellowship, so I'm, I have to pay tax at the moment. But I guess that's a bit different. Um, for the fellowship, I think it's counted as a scholarship, so you don't have to pay tax, I think, mm. in the UK. Okay. So because of the Todd Croucher uh, arrangement. And yeah, so it's more like a salary. Mm -mm. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on. Concurrent awards, yes. If I am already a recipient of a Hong Kong PhD fellowship scheme and um, PhD has already commenced, can I apply for the research studentship? Um, that's a yes, uh, you can apply for concurrent awards, but you will need to let us know by the time you apply and also uh, the um, foundation award scheme uh, on the Hong Kong side now as well, because it's concurrent award and affect uh, the amount that you are paid on the other side. Okay, uh, Is it a disadvantage if the PhD program is already decently funded by the institution? Um, uh, no, for the studentship, we welcome students to, to consider our funding. Will there be any income boundaries for the application? It depends. Uh, once you get the award and offer letter from your university and if it has income involved, uh, we will need to check against our offer. Uh, 
there is no particular boundaries I can share for now, but if it requires uh, you to teach, uh, we have a requirement minimum um, um, of six hours per week for teaching. Okay, that's the, sorry, that's the maximum uh, hours, six hours maximum um, um, of teaching allowed. Timeline, uh, when I can leave for the university for postdoc, if selected, the earliest will be uh, August, uh, September time of fall, 2024, if um, you want to start really early uh, for the funding award. Application and interview timeline. Uh, we are accepting applications now um, until mid-November. Then we will process the application and interviews will be scheduled in March, April time. And in two weeks time for successful candidates, they will get their results uh, in form through email and also uh, by post as well. For unsuccessful uh, applicants, they will be informed in May. Okay, so that's the schedule. Format of interview, how many rounds of interview are there uh, conducted in person or virtually? There's only one round of interview with our academic panel. And in person or virtually, we cannot confirm now, uh, but we have done in person and uh, through Zoom before. Okay. Is it required to attend the, uh, the interview in person in Hong Kong if I get shortlisted? If we arrange face-to-face -face interview, uh, that happened uh, before COVID, yes, uh, overseas candidates would be required to fly in back to Hong Kong for face-to-face -face interviews. Yeah, at their own expense. Okay. Application uh, preparation. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let all the scholars here, our speakers here, to help me with these questions. These in groups because some of them are quite similar. Uh, application preparation. Uh, what do you think uh, is the most important thing to prepare in the application process? Uh, any tips, important elements against just data? potential of studies or gaps, yeah. Daniel, Richard, you look. Go ahead. Um, I think to prepare a proposal, you should like um, find the research area that you're really interested in, and then see if you can find the professors or a PI that does the similar things. And then from there, you can work your way out. So like, reading a few recent paper, paper publications from that PI, um, trying to have a grasp of the general research questions. So when you read your paper, you can ask questions like, oh, should I do this? Should I do that? What will happen if I change this and change that? And then slowly you will find the research gap and from there you can work your way out, putting a proposal around it. So I think that's, that's the approach I used when I um, preparing for a proposal. Mm -hmm. And I think the proposal, the format is quite general. So you have this. So I started with the objective, a very clear objective of the what I'm going to try to achieve in this project. And then afterwards, you have this introduction of the background of the research. And then it is followed by some more technical details, like what experiments or, or works you're going to do, you're going to carry out during this proposal. I think one thing to keep in mind is that make sure the proposal is really, really detailed. It has to cover every single aspect of the research project. So looking at different angles, trying to um, um, put down things that cover everything, I think that is the most important thing of the proposal. Yeah, and to, to add on to what Richard said about finding um, this research gap, um, an alternative method you could also do is, um, so you, let's say you know a broad research angle that you're interested in, like, um, for example, salmonella infections. What you can do is you can go on um, Google Scholar and find a recent literature review that's broadly about that topic. And because a literature review kind of reviews like the current state of that research area, you can they also probably state near towards the end what kinds of things, what kinds of areas, or what kind of directions they're trying to that are kind of like 
hot topics at the moment with that research area. And you can also look at these kinds of gaps that they've mentioned in the in those reviews. Like, are am I interested in them? And then you can from there also like then continue on with what Richard said. Find um, some names that were kind of mentioned or labs or citations in that in that gap or that paragraph that might have mentioned these directions and from there reach out to them. And um, to add on to that, um, for the um, the research proposal, um, in a, in addition to the into in addition to detail, another good thing to kind of mention is uh, definitely the limitations of study. But not only listing that, but also how you would try to tackle these potential pitfalls if they do arise. Like mention like how you would mitigate it because that shows that you're not expect you might expect problems to arise, but you've already thought it through and you know you can address them when they come. And um, one more thing as well is um, to make sure the proposal is um, um, simple, like simple enough to understand, not necessarily for like, like for like a high school level science student, but at least definitely for a, a university level science student to understand because you don't know whether or not your panelists are definite specialists in that field. So one good way to pra like to kind of you know improve on your proposal is to let's say you're an expert in, or your your proposals on microbiology. You could give it to a biology undergrad final year student to read, and or your friend who's doing that and ask them, does this make sense to you for the most part? Does the background you know is the is the detail I'm supplementing like does it make sense? And if they say yes, that's great. If there are bits and pieces that they don't quite understand, that's that's where you modify, try to make, try to, um, you know, simplify it, make, make things more, uh, concise. But yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, um, for a tips of writing proposal, the point that I can think of is first, like, again, same as Richard and Daniel mentioned, you need to ensure enough time to read literature and know your focuses. Cause I do think that like intense, um, literature review or like reading papers will help you to know what is the background research gap as well as like also helping you to write some of the technical details when you need to mention some of the method that you propose to work on this direction as well and I also agree that communication is really important because um, during my preparation since I work in the same lab in the final, my final year project as well so I do show my proposal to like my colleagues or my potential supervisor who ask for advice and really see if like people from different background or with different expertise can understand my proposal yeah thank you very useful um if uh, any of you oh sir please go on um, I think to make your scholarship or fellowship application more strong is that you have to try to combine your expertise with your proposed research area. So for example, my research, my PhD research is on host gas chemistry. So I'm, I'm trying to incorporate that to in my fellowship applications. So that I think is like, it's very general for fellowship applications. You have to make yourself as the only person in the world probably to conduct this research. So I think that that is quite important. Richard, uh, all very useful uh, comments on, on the tips um, for writing a proposal. So if any of our participants have any follow-up questions on what our uh, scholars have said just now, uh, do type in the Q&A so we can um, follow up um, on your question. Um, okay, how to write a detailed research proposal if research topic is not yet decided. Uh, research gap, I think, as uh, uh, we have covered already, uh, how technical and detailed, uh, Richard mentioned already, needs to be detailed. Uh, what kind of formatting uh, is expected? I think I covered it in uh, the notes for applicants in terms of the formatting. Uh, what would make a strong application for fellowship? I think um, Richard has, um, mentioned about that already. Interview preparation, so next stage. Um, how can I prepare for the interview? Oh, sorry. sorry. Nope. Sorry about that. Um, how can I prepare for the interview? What kind of questions are coming and what is emphasized in the 
scholarship came to fill. Uh, so let's hear from our scholars. But from my perspective, if I can uh, firstly comment on that, uh, you will be asked to give a, a one minute or three minute presentation uh, uh, with a, a designated number of slides uh, in the interview. Um, I would suggest not to cram everything in your PowerPoint slides because that's quite difficult for our panel members to to read in the first place. Um, so that's uh, what I've seen in some of the interviews as well. Yeah. Keep the visual content uh, simple. Um, so any tips? Oh, it keeps moving, sorry. Uh, any tips on the interview preparation? Yeah, adding on the PowerPoint slide, I do agree that the PowerPoint slide is really important. So in my preparation, I'm allowed to show only one slide. And I would say it is essential to for the audiences to follow as long as well as for you to like think uh, when you are answering the questions in Q&A as you can refer to your slides as well. So I would recommend that uh, we try to, we can try to include like flow charts or timeline, try to use visuals to show like some of the logic flow and you may state the key points only, like what are the key um, objectives or some of the important statistics that would, like, you would like to show, but do not over um, packed your slides. And the second thing that I do during the interview preparation is I keep asking myself questions like, why would you do this? Why would you plan your proposal in this way? Why would you choose this methodology instead of the other one? So I keep asking myself questions regarding the details that you mentioned in the proposal. And I think I do think that this helps when I face different questions from the panel during the interview. Yeah, no, and uh, to add on to what Yilok said, um, the 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 thing about making uh, about like asking yourself questions. Um, sometimes the questions that might be asked during the interview, at least this was from my experience, personal experience, um, the questions might be about fundamental concepts in your area. So, for example, because I was doing bacteriophages, some questions was just like, "Can you give me a quick rundown on what's the life cycle of the typical life cycle of a bacteriophage, or are there?" different life cycles. And I'm not going to lie, that caught me off guard um, at the start. But and so it really goes to show you, you got to understand that like your, your, your feel thoroughly, like even the basic questions. And so that means not only like asking your, you yourself asking those questions, you could also just hand your proposal to, like you said, like a friend who's only like somewhat familiar with the area and see what kinds of um, not basic, but like, you know, base, yeah, basic questions that they might have as well. And those are good ways to prepare as well. And another thing is, um, to add on also what Yilok said about like why you chose this methodology, um, a common reason you might add is because this technique is state of the art. It's the latest, but that might not necessarily address why it's appropriate for your research. Like take like, um, um, a technology like um, AlphaFold, right? That AI protein folding thing. It's new, but do you need nece do you necessarily need it if traditional techniques are already cheaper, more reliable? Uh, there are all, there are only certain cases where that technology might be more useful, even if it's new. And being able to kind of answer that is definitely um, shows more insight in, into your research. But yeah, for your interview. And I think for my approach is that I go through my proposal, sentence by sentence, word by word, and trying to come up with questions that can potentially appear during the interview. So I, so I got like a hundred questions from that in the six pages of proposal. And then I make sure I, ask, I can answer each and every single one of them like perfectly. So I think that's the approach I use for my interview preparation. And some questions you can almost they almost always appear it's like, oh, why do you choose your PI? Um, uh, one thing to ask is that, so in your research area, there are many people doing the same with same kind of research. So you have to like be, you have to have a strong reason to support why you want to go to that specific PI that you chose, but not someone else who is doing like similar research. So not only do you have to know your prospective PI's research, you have to also know other people who are doing something similar. So I think that would be also beneficial for you as well in the, in the long run. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Richard. So it sounds like lots of prep work to do before the interview 
dissecting your your proposal uh, with all the whys and so what question and make sure it's relevant to you and your research. So yeah, that's very useful. Um, that's, oh, that's our second last slide on supervisor. Um, I think um, that's a very important aspect as well uh, to supplement the, the, the support, the application. How does one decide for the supervisor, especially if they are keen to take students or discuss prospects uh, once the financial support is uh, substantiated? Do you have any advice to approach a professor um, for uh, UK, US um, applications? Do I need to have secure position with a research group already before applying or it's okay to have just potential supervisors in mind? So a uh, few areas there, how, um, how to approach and some asked about specifically for UK slash US uh, supervisors. Um, I think the key thing is to just give you like more time to look for potential supervisor because sometimes they just don't reply to emails. So I think there are like two major ways that we, I would use. So the first way is the, the hard, the easy way, which is you find a PI that you know and ask him or her to send an email to the prospective supervisor. And they usually will reply to this kind of email. And the hard way, the, and then the second way is the hard way, which is the one I use is that you have to send an email to the professors yourself. But very often they just don't reply to emails because they're so busy, they get like tens of thousands of emails every single day. So you have to make sure that in your email, you show how keen you are in joining their groups. So you can put a paragraph like, oh, I've read your recent publications on blah, blah, blah. And I, I'm very interested in that. I want to um, work on this area more. So please can we have a Zoom chat or something? So that will help a lot. But sometimes even you put that, they will just still ignore your email. So what I did was that um, I have to write a brief proposal, very simple proposal, like four to five pages, about things that they actually want to do in their group. And they usually need to be replied to some kind of email like this, because it shows your how keen you are in joining that group. So that's the approach I took when I um, find my current supervisor, actually. Yeah, no. Um similar uh I, I had a similar thing where it was kind of like i sent out uh, some emails to some potential supervisors where i was just like hi um this is what i'm doing and this is what i i what i love about your group um i think i i didn't do um a big research proposal but i i guess i just wrote like a short paragraph one or two about why i was interested in their research and how i w wanted to kind of contribute to it um but i think that if these um the 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 super uh these potential supervisors if they don't reply to you I don't think it's uh don't take it personal is what I'd say it's because these guys have got you know a bunch of emails you know piling up on their inboxes every day so what that means is don't be afraid to kind of like reply to your own emails and like hey I don't know if you've had time to look at this um, really would appreciate it if you could you know consider and sometimes um and, and this was the this was the case for my supervisor they they then replied. Uh, after I gave it a little, like a little nudge. Um, so yeah, don't take it personal with that. And um, another thing is um, about like the, that question about needing to secure a position with a research group. What happened in my case was when I approached the supervisor, they were like, oh, I, we'd be happy to take you in. But the thing is like funding for international students is a bit tough. And so what I had to do was I had to email, um, CCing the supervisor, I had to email the admissions committee for to Imperial College and say like, um, could you please like, uh, I, like I'm implying to this, but uh, just black and white, uh, my, I, I am aware that my acceptance to this PhD program is contingent on me receiving this funding from Croucher Scholarship. And after that, they were cool with it. And then they sent out um, an offer letter of course, with the supervisor's thumbs up. And yeah, and then I gave that kind of letter to uh, the Croucher Foundation and the rest was history. Yeah. Okay, then. You look. You want to share about um, your your experience or approach with supervisors? Um, My approach to, like, to find my supervisor is 
pretty much the same as Daniel that I try to reach the, uh, read some of the pa previous paper from the same supervisor and like show my keen interest and passion in related view and show my reason that I, why I want to work on this topic or this field in particular compared to others. And I do agree that um, sometimes resending your email is helpful because supervisors are super busy and my current supervisor also missed my first email and I try like after a few days I resend my email and say hey, hey wondering any updates or maybe I uh, you miss my email and I'm trying to resend it and I I do think this helps yeah thank you that's very useful and uh, we understand by that stage usually it comes to uh uh, the stage that when you are waiting for the Croucher offer and the university might be waiting for your funding situation. So it might be that um, situation for some of our application, uh, applicants and that uh, we will try to be uh, as quick as possible with our offer letters and confirmation and work with you on the timeline that works uh, with uh, your university as well. Yeah, uh, I think these are the um, stop sharing screen. I think these are the uh, pre uh, preset uh, present uh, questions. And um, Anna, I'll look to you for the Q and A questions. Uh, I'm not able to see all the questions uh, while I was sharing screen. Um, are there any top burning questions that we, we can help address while we have about eight minutes before we close or some of them are answered already. Mm -hmm. um, one question is directed to Richard from Hu Liao Zhou, uh, the second one. Uh, Hi yeah, Richard, yeah, maybe Richard can address the questions and there are some more and I'm answering uh, if I have time and possible. Okay, so, uh, yeah, that question is, um, not sure if everyone can read the uh, Q&A here. Uh, it's wonderful to hear that Richard is doing postdoc at Cambridge. It's, um, um, so is exploring postdoc in the UK connected with professors at Nottingham and Cambridge, and he wished to know whether the ranking of the institution would be uh, assessment criteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I don't think the ranking matters that much. I think um, it doesn't matter at all, actually. So I think what matters is like um, whether the kind of research that they have matches your interest. If it does, mm. then I think it's all for it. So just don't care about the ranking that much. Yeah. Thank you. And we have um, scholars uh, in Cambridge and not them uh, before. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another question that the panel may be able to address is that how many aims or objectives do they need to put or include in the proposal? Oh, I think it, um, I think for my proposal, I put like three aims. I think it was, yeah. I put three broad aims, and they were, and they, and they also like, you know, they were in sequence. Like they made sense. Like what I would want, what I need to discover something first, then kind of characterize it, and then see it in action in a certain context. That was like the three broad aims I, I kind of went for, and I guess y'all can do something similar. Yeah, my. My proposal also got like three major aims. Um, they're also like interconnected as well. So they're like in sequence. So you, you have to go through first part and the second part and the third part. So everything is like covered in the rest of the proposal. Yeah. Yeah, I included two and they're also building up on the previous one. Okay. Uh, okay, I see uh, one question here. How many supervisors do applicants typically reach out to? Hmm. Ooh, so this one's uh this one's an interesting one. I reached mm. out to about I'd say I think it was around eight 
or nine I reached out to about. And I think from those eight or nine, um, I had further discussions with about three of them, three of them. And then from these three, well, I stuck with one, obviously. But yeah. Thank you, Dan. And I, for my scholarship vacation, I reached out to, I think, five or six, but only like two of them replied my email. And for my fellowship, I only applied to one, actually, because I was really, really persistent trying to like get his attention, trying to get him to take me as a postdoc. So yeah, I think that, that like the persistence, you have, you have to be really persistent if you want to get response from the professors. Yeah. And you're doubting. <laughs> Good luck. Do you want to share? Um, in my case, because I also work in the same lab during my FYP, so I mm -hmm. do show my interest in super early stage that I I'm wishing to pursue PhD also in the same topic. So I only reach out to one. Yeah. Um, and Anna, any ones that have come up top that um perhaps we can have our panel to answer one more question. Um, one I'm not too familiar, I would like to hear from our panel as well, for publications to review articles, can't. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I, I personally think they still count, like it's still something that's peer reviewed and put out um okay. but it, it, like it also depends like what what are you re what research area are you reviewing on is it is it close to or similar to your research proposal that also gauges how important it is i suppose yeah i think it counts as well but just make sure you don't have only review articles when you apply for your fellowship so you need some like research paper as well yeah um, I see one question here from Annie Lee. Uh, in the interview stage, are the interviewers composed of people with scientific background, similar to the research direction, or are they people with general scientific background? Um, I think our, uh, our panel can comment on that, but in terms of the composition, we usually in, involve uh, uh, a variety of experts in different fields, but usually there's at least one who is in your research area who can pose uh, more detailed questions to you. Yeah. Not sure if the panel agree or if you can comment. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I think uh, for my case, um, out of the panelists, there were two experts. So there was one, um, there was one physician scientist, and there was one cell biologist. So um, they weren't like, super like they weren't like exactly specializing in the stuff I wanted to do, but um, they were aware enough of like, like is that the bait, like the more, the more basic overarching concepts. Um, and so that's why, like, they were able to ask those kinds of like, like um, like a uh, curveball, like foundation questions. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I do get questions like from super general one on the basic concepts. Can you explain this or explain that? Or to like technical questions on why this methodology or what's the limitation of that? So I do think it we get quite a range of questions. Okay. Um, I see there are two separate questions about the Max Planck Croucher Fellowship and also whether there's a quota with the uh, Oxford uh, Croucher uh, arrangement. Um, and like I said before, um, at the application stage, you only need to apply uh, to the Croucher Foundation using our application form. If you are applying to Max Planck or uh, sorry, or Oxford or Cambridge in particular, if you are se uh, selected after the interview, we will approach these institutions uh, for these partnerships uh, uh, awards. Yeah. Some of them have a, a, a quota, but um, 
uh, we cannot disclose the number here, um, but that's the process we 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 work on at Croucher. As you, you apply to us first, and then we will approach the partner institution for the joint award. Okay. Uh, I'm conscious of time. Uh, it's um one hour to uh um five o'clock now. So I would like to thank you everyone who have joined us, and again to Yilok, uh, Daniel, Richard, and also Anna for organizing and joining us uh through this discussion. Um, we hope to get your application uh, later in November and um, good luck with your preparation and uh, with your studies. Okay, thanks for joining mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Anna? And do email us at info at uh, if you have any questions that are unanswered in the Q&A box. Thank you for joining okay. us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Yilok. Thank bye you, Richard. Bye. Yeah, thank thanks. You. Thank you. Good luck. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. 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 bye.